Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with our traditional preview of our ClassicsToday.com insider feature. And we're starting on a different path. Now, instead of just doing conductors, and don't worry, we're going to be doing more of them, we are also going to do orchestras, which I think is actually an even more fascinating topic. What makes an orchestra special? What makes it unique? What are an orchestra's best recordings? And the orchestra we're starting with is possibly the most unique that has yet been recorded. It's the Paris Conservatory Orchestra. L'Orchestre de la Société des Concerts du Conservatoire. That's what they were called. And I'm going to explain to you just what makes them so special. I have talked about them quite a bit in these in these these videos. So if you've been watching them over the past couple of years, you already know some of what I'm going to say. But if you haven't, I urge you to take a listen. And also, please do consider subscribing to ClassicsToday.com because if you want to know what the 10 best recordings are or the 10, let's say, most characteristic recordings, the ones that make this orchestra sound special, then you have to be an insider subscriber. And the link to subscribe is in the description of this very video. Or you can just go to classicstoday.com and sign up on our home page. It works either way. Now, what makes this orchestra so special? Well, it was founded in 1828 and it ceased to exist in 1967. So it has the longest unbroken tradition of performance of any orchestra in the world, period. And that's all there is to it. Now, I know there's this sort of contest to see who has the oldest tradition. And some people will tell you, oh, it's like the Leipzig Gewandhaus, because the Gewandhaus is a building, it's a room. And there were concerts in this room going back to like the 15th century. And the orchestra traces its origins back to like the 12th century, which traces that origins back to like the Roman Empire, which traces those origins back to the Neanderthals. I mean, you know, which trace their origins back to the Cenozoic period. I mean, no, 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 no. We're talking about a regularly constituted modern orchestra. And that was the Paris Conservatory Orchestra. And everybody knew it. Everybody knew it. Louis Spohr, you know, Louis Spohr, you know who he was? He wrote tons and tons and tons of rather boring music. Um, and he also wrote one of the one of the iconic violin treatises published in the 1830s. He was a major composer. He played in the premiere of Beethoven's Seventh. You know, he was a, a serious, serious guy, very, very popular until about, you know, the, the second half of the 19th century when his music fell out of favor. Um, and he, even he acknowledged that the, the great orchestra um, in terms of technique and constitution and the way they were taught to play was the Paris Conservatory Orchestra. It was the first orchestra Spohr wrote um, who, which used uniform bowing, which had all the violins playing up and down at the same time, like we're used to seeing today. But that's not what made the orchestra so fascinating from our perspective. Well, partly it is. From a performance practice point of view, it's interesting. But the orchestra was founded in 1828 by the conductor Francois Antoine Habeneck. Now, Habeneck had known Beethoven, and he was a violinist and a very, very well known guy in the period who was at the Paris Conservatory. And he founded the Paris Conservatory Orchestra for the express purpose of performing all of Beethoven's major orchestral works. Their very first concert featured the Eroica Symphony, and it made a huge sensation in Paris. Now, there had always been performances of Beethoven before this particular orchestra was constituted, but what he wanted was an orchestra of the best that only played the best concert music, and and he achieved this aim. He really did. And it was really remarkable. The grand tradition of Beethoven playing does not originate in Vienna. 
That is one of the great myths that we've always, you know, we always hear. And, you know, record labels always want the Vienna Philharmonic to be doing, to be doing Beethoven. Well, the real tradition of Beethoven playing, as far as I'm concerned, moved to France um, in the wake of the Napoleonic Wars and with the advent of the Paris Conservatory. And the reason is because Beethoven's orchestral music was so difficult um, and required so much intensive rehearsal to do it justice that it raised the level of orchestral performance. And it is a, a, a genuine fact, a really serious issue and a really serious fact that to a large extent, the modern symphony orchestra was the creation of Beethoven because it was to play his music that this orchestra was founded and his works became immediately the linchpin of the orchestral repertoire. Now, of course, there were orchestras all over Europe um, and every noble house had one. And a lot at this point, by the 1820s and 30s, municipalities were beginning to have their own orchestras and those orchestras also performed this music. But none of them had the glamour, the polish, the finesse, the reputation of the Paris Conservatory Orchestra. And what fascinates me particularly about this particular group is that not only was it was it a a you know Beethoven orchestral music dedicated ensemble of music professionals who had a regular season going that season by the way was very short it was only like 12 concerts because you know people did not stick around in the city you know they they came for the season which was usually around the winter where there were two seasons there was one around you know christmas time you know in that area and one around Easter time. And then, of course, they had to clear out for the annual cholera epidemic or whatever bubonic plague, whatever, whatever was raging um, through the streets of Paris at that time. And everyone just sort of cleared out. So it wasn't quite what we think it is now. But the orchestra was comprised of professors and the best students from the Paris Conservatory. And what's interesting about it is that it was very much a modern symphony orchestra. So when you see these period instrument people telling you that this is what it sounded like in Beethoven's day and this is how big the orchestra was, it's all nonsense. It may have been true. There may have been specific events where composers had to make do with pint-sized orchestras and, and, you know, all kinds of quotidian um, circumstances that they wished they didn't have to deal with, but they had to. But the Paris Conservatory Orchestra had 80 players from the beginning. In other words, it was a large modern symphony orchestra. They played, they played Beethoven and Haydn and Mozart primarily from the beginning with that size of an ensemble. They didn't reduce the orchestra because they were playing those works. Not a bit. They played it to the you know, it was a perfectly sensible thing for them to play it with the full forces and make it as grand as Habeneck knew from personal experience of chatting with Haydn and Beethoven. Mozart, of course, had been dead, but he knew what these people wanted. He knew what they thought was ideal. And his ideal was very much the ideal for the classical repertoire that they performed. And so today, when we listen to, to, you know, classical repertoire of this type, and we hear it on period instruments, we have really a choice. You have a choice. Would you prefer to hear it uh, in a speculative reconstruction of the rather unfortunate circumstances of performance of the day, um, prognosticated or suggested by a bunch of scholars who truly have absolutely no idea whether anything that they're saying actually happened the way they said it did, whether the sounds that they're making or that they propose that we make were the sounds that those composers either heard or intended, or alternately, you could listen to a living tradition of the performance of that music, a truly unbroken living tradition of, admittedly, a single school and a single place. But uh, I, I think, the, for me, the choice is very clear. I think it's great that we have both. I'm not saying this to demean the scholarship. I am not. I am not. The only thing I demean is when they say that they're right and that what modern orchestras do is inherently wrong. 
because what modern orchestras do today is the natural result of the system implemented by Habeneck for the Paris Conservatory Orchestra. It became the model for what orchestras should be throughout Europe. And everybody else in one way or another began to imitate the standards that they upheld and the types of performances that they gave and the repertoire that they played. And so modern, modern orchestras and modern performance is, you know, is not some sort, of, some sort of aberration or some sort of you know, extremely anachronistic view of this music. It isn't. It's the natural outgrowth of this living tradition. Now, what happened to the Paris Conservatory Orchestra? It's actually rather sad. The Paris Conservatory Orchestra had uh, a number of illustrious conductors throughout the 19th century and into the 20th. The last two were Charles Munch, who was no slouch, and then André Cuitins. So, I mean, Cuitins and Munch, it's quite, quite a, you know, pairing right there at the very, very end. But in 1967, their finances were in trouble, and, and the orchestra, you know, was sort of, it was run by a committee of its members, and it was, it was, you know, especially in France, you know, I mean, you know, it was bureaucratic and dysfunctional, and so the French government decided to reorganize the orchestras in Paris, particularly because they wanted to have a true world-class orchestra, and at that point, the standard of world-classosity had become things like the Vienna Philharmonic or Carion and the Berlin Philharmonic, you know, those great European orchestras. So they, they basically canned the Orchestre de Paris and reformed it with a whole slew of new players and about half of its former personnel. I mean, they canned the Paris Conservatory Orchestra and renamed it the Orchestre de Paris. There we go, let me get it straight. And the Orchestre de Paris incorporated about half the players from the Paris Conservatory Orchestra. But its whole concept of sound, of sonority, was different. And because the players were no longer exclusively limited to those who had been trained at the Paris Conservatory, the entire corporate sonority became totally different. And, and what we were used to from the, the, the Paris Conservatory Orchestra vanished, never to return. It has gone, 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 except for the recordings, which fortunately are quite numerous. And there are wonderful, wonderful performances all over the place featuring this orchestra of a wide, wide range of repertoire. And that is what I propose to discuss in my list of their 10 most characteristic recordings, the ones where you hear music that you think you know, but you will hear it played in ways that you have never heard it played before. And it's a very, very interesting experience. I guarantee it. So once again, I do ask that you subscribe to ClassicsToday.com as an insider and hop on over and join me over there for the list of this orchestra's 10 most characteristic recordings. I guarantee it's going to be a fascinating journey as we explore this and other remarkable orchestras with their own customized kind of sonority. Keep on listening, folks. Take care.